Well, one year ago today, hundreds of people gathered outside of Wall Street in New York City and staged a protest, staged a protest against big banks, corporate greed, and the fast-growing gap in inequality around the country. They called the wealthiest people the 1% and everyone else the 99%. They stayed day and night in Manhattan's Zuccotti Park. And within a few days, there were similar protests in every major city in this country and in other countries as well. And the hundreds turned into thousands. RT, of course, has covered this since day one, so we want to take a look at what's next for Occupy Wall Street. We've got Anastasia Cherkina live in our New York studio and in our Los Angeles studio, RT's Ramon Galindo. And Anastasia, let me begin with you. Uh, today, in honor of the one-year anniversary, hundreds of people came back to New York. And from what I'm told, by 9 o'clock this morning, there were reports that 100 people had already been arrested. Um, just talk a little bit about what you've seen transpire over the day. Christine, it really is, uh, you know, time flies. I can't really believe it's already been a year. It seems like only yesterday we were down at uh, the financial district on a chilly autumn uh, Saturday, waiting to see exactly what Occupy Wall Street would turn into. And I have to tell you, certainly nobody, even the protesters on day one, many of them were not even sure what kind of shape and form this movement would take. And I'm sure we're not even aware that it would last as long as it has. Now, uh, yes, today we're seeing the marking of the one year anniversary of Occupy. Uh, people started descending uh, towards the Wall Street area, towards the financial district. People were gathered outside the New York Stock Exchange. Throughout the day, there have been already hundreds of people marching the streets of the city, uh, some of them based in Zuccotti Park, some of them taking part in different action throughout the city. We can confirm right now that so far there have been 146 arrests just in New York City just today. And of course, uh, the day is uh, only really beginning. More people are still gathering so we're going to have to wait and see exactly uh, how many more arrests take place something that seems inevitable considering the amount of tension that is taking place on the ground right now as we speak because protesters are still very much disappointed that their message is not being listened to by officials in New York and in the United States let's go now to Ramon uh, Ramon uh there's been some, uh, a shift, you could say, in, in some of the goals of Occupy Wall Street. At first, uh, there was a whole lot of talk of, you know, issues like money and politics. Uh, but where you are, I know we saw quite a few, you know, Occupy Our Homes protests that have produced concrete results. Talk a little bit about the evolution as you have witnessed it on the West Coast. That's absolutely right, Christine. We've definitely seen Occupy Wall Street go from that massive encampment that we saw in downtown Los Angeles to more localized protests. And as you mentioned, the Occu Occupy Homes campaign, which has been quite successful in keeping troubled homeowners uh, in their home right now. Occupiers are currently occupying a home in the San Fernando Valley. The family there got an eviction notice. And for the past three weeks, occupiers have set up camp there and have been able to deter the sheriff from uh, from taking the house, uh, pretty much. And they've also been able to you know, join forces with other community groups, church groups, to also put pressure on the city and banks to renegotiate with homeowners. So there's definitely been a, a large success in that. And just overall on the West Coast, uh, the Occupy Movement has been actually quite successful in uh, pushing municipalities uh, to practice better, um, better business, uh, pressuring them to really do business with banks that are not out there for closing on people unfairly. So uh, although we are not seeing that mass... Uh, movement in the streets, that mass encampment downtown, we're definitely seeing uh, some small successes in the communities around California and the West Coast. And we should say as well that, uh, you know, even uh, since that time over the last year, the mainstream media, which did not acknowledge the movement really at first, uh, has started to do countless stories about topics like the growing gap in inequality in this country. Inequality will most likely also be one of the main themes in November's election. Um, Anastasia, though, talk about some of the results. Uh, you have covered this uh, since the first day. You've been on the ground. You've spoken to, to countless people. Uh, what do they feel have been some of the biggest successes in New York? Well, you know, Christine, not just, not just in New York, but in the United States, of course, uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement flourished all over this country. And one of the biggest successes that I think most people are talking about on this one-year anniversary is the fact that this movement started national dialogue. And this is something that's being underlined by everybody, because years into the aftermath of the financial collapse in the United States, people were feeling that the issues of accountability of Wall Street, of politicians sleeping in the same bed with Wall 
Wall Street and corporations still funding and sponsoring politicians were issues that were not being addressed and just kind of brushed aside ever since the economic collapse took place. And what Occupy Wall Street did to many supporters is bring back this conversation, bring out this outrage that these were things that have still not been tackled. And certainly we have seen, uh, you know, varied results of exactly how some of the issues that Occupy Wall Street has been uh, pushing for have been addressed. But it's curious to note here that uh, despite the sort of sarcasm and irony with which the mainstream media has largely been treating the Occupy Wall Street movement, even today I've seen uh, reports in the mainstream newspapers calling it uh, a feisty little movement. Well, for many of the people who support this Occupy Wall Street movement in the United States, it's done a lot more than just be feisty out on the streets. And even the politicians, who uh, many of whom refuse to really come out and say that they do understand this, the concerns of the Occupy Wall Street movement, many experts say that we're seeing them right now, today, uh, the Democrats mostly using uh, the Occupy Wall Street message in their uh, election campaign. So these are issues that are not just alien to the United States. And uh, many people, some are willing to admit this, others are not, but this still continues to underline the fact that Occupy Wall Street did bring this conversation out into the light. Yeah, certainly, Anastasia. A whole lot of people would have been surprised at six months, eight months ago, uh, if you would have told them on the one-year anniversary uh, this movement would be alive and well, uh, would again draw quite a few, few people to the streets, but also would have shifted uh, the conversation. And Ramon, I want to talk to you about another shift in that conversation, and that is about debt relief. Debt relief for individuals. Um, I know that Occupy also called massive uh, attention to the student loan debt in this country. Um, this is sort of uh, the, the way, uh, the path that the movement has been on uh, for the last few months. Do you think this strategy has been more effective to them uh, to, to talk more about debt? Well, it has been effective because we, we have to remember that Occupy the movement has gathered very mainstream support early on. I mean, the messages that uh, of wealth and equality uh, were very popular. It's just that uh, many in the mainstream America just didn't agree with their tactics. And what we were seeing in Occupy were demonstrators who had never been activists before. They were, you know, white middle class uh, college graduates who all of a sudden found themselves with tens of thousands of dollars in college debt, yet being unable to find the, a job. So really this issue of debt, uh, whether it be college loans or mortgage debt, was really able to solidify a lot of support because uh, such a growing number of people were affected by this issue. So in that sense, uh, it has been uh, you know, a great galvanizing force on college campuses, but also in neighborhoods which previously were middle class and are really feeling the ill effects of uh, the mortgage crisis, which is still raging years after uh, you know, that Wall Street crash. And we can't forget another uh, issue that Occupy has really shined a light on in this country is police brutality. Uh, this is an issue that if you talk to people in certain neighborhoods and cities around this country, they say uh, this is something they have experienced for decades. However, uh, when you see, for example, um, people getting hit with police batons in the middle of the streets of New York City, when you see student protesters having pepper spray mm. at the University of California at Berkeley uh, sprayed in their face, uh, you know, at a length this close, uh, this has been a, a great surprise to many people. Uh, Nastia, I want to ask you this last question. In terms of uh, police brutality and the role that Occupy has played in exposing this. Christine, Occupy has played a major role in exposing this. Of course, we've seen police brutality really run rampant. And uh, some of the most gruesome footage we've seen and uh, our crews have filmed uh, is just really something you don't expect to see in the United States and that's something that people have not seen in the U.S. for years. If we remember some of the, you know, the episodes that you mentioned, women being pepper sprayed in the face, students sitting down being pepper sprayed while they're sitting and not moving, the hundreds of arrests that we've seen taking place, uh, one that comes to mind is on the Brooklyn Bridge, over 700 people arrested, brutality, people dragged around. On May Day, we're seeing tens of thousands of people uh, really flooding the streets of New York, faced with batons 
batons uh, in Chicago for one during the anti-NATO protests. We've seen police officers use bicycles to uh, try to stop the protesters from crossing barricades. Really insane uh, footage that we've seen throughout the year. In Oakland, for example, when we saw war veterans, a war veteran being uh, injured into unconsciousness by the clashes with police. This is something that has been just uh, really rampant, something very unexpected for many Americans, I'm True. sure, and something that unfortunately we're still seeing today where there's a major disconnect between the way the officials and the protesters are confronting each other and uh, the police really uh, not letting the message of the protesters get across, right. even when people are not necessarily doing anything that's not law-abiding. All right, uh, very good points raised. RT correspondent Anastasia Cherkina and RT correspondent Ramon Galindo, thanks so much.